Hello, and welcome to the BYU Family History Library webinar series. We're glad you could join us today. I'm Anna Allred, and I'll be your host for this webinar. If you have technical difficulties during the webinar, please use the chat box and I can address your concerns. You are welcome to use the chat box during the webinar for comments, insights, and questions. However, all questions will be addressed at the end of the presentation. Our next webinar will be on November 3rd, researching the great northward migration 1916 to 1970, the movement of 6 million African Americans with James Tanner at 5.30 p.m. If you'd like to access a previous webinar, please visit our webinar index on our website or search on our YouTube channel. All of our webinars are recorded and uploaded by the following Monday for your convenience. We also post links to recordings and other updates on our Facebook and Twitter accounts. For today's webinar, we are pleased to hear from Dave Obi, who will be giving a presentation on Canadian genealogy online. Dave Obi is a journalist and genealogical researcher who has written a dozen books and given more than 600 presentations at conferences and seminars in Canada, the United States, and Australia since 1997. He is editor and publisher of the Times Colonist daily newspaper in Victoria, British Columbia. He has worked as a journalist in British Columbia and Alberta since 1972 and has been researching family history since 1978. In 2012, Dave was awarded an honorary doctorate of laws by the University of Victoria for his work as a historian, genealogist, and journalist. He was a member of the Services Consultation Committee at Library and Archives Canada in Ottawa for four years. Dave is a columnist for Internet Genealogy Magazine and your Genealogy Today's Mag Today Magazine, formerly Fam Family Chronicle. Dave, Obi, if you're ready, we'll turn the time over to you. Great, thank you very much. We'll see how things work here. It's warning me that I have to stop your, sh your screen sharing, so here we go. Um, as you mentioned, as Anna mentioned, the, 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 con the talk today is on Canadian genealogy online. I've been, been working on, as, as she mentioned, family history for coming on to 44 years now. And I've, uh, I've, I've had research in basically every, every province in the, in the country. Um, and uh, I've learned one or two things along the way. There's, but there's, there's always more to be learned, always more to be done when you're doing, doing any kind of family history research. Because, because there's just so much more um, that we don't know. And also there's, there's the, the whole concept of more stuff becoming available all the time. There is a handout for this talk. It's on my website, davewilby.com, and uh, the arrow points to roughly where it is. Uh, under the upcoming presentations, uh, there's a reference there, a link there to the handout. It's, it's I think, a four-page PDF uh, downloaded at your convenience. I'll probably keep that link live for a couple of days in case anyone wants that. I've, I've written a couple of books uh, on, specific to, to, to uh, genealogy in Canada. One is on the Canadian census, one is on immigration records, and I believe that, that the BYU library has both of those books. The basics that people have to learn um, about doing Canadian research, um, it, you know, the, the, the information I give in this talk sort of varies depending on, on, on the audience, and, I, and with, a, with a virtual uh, session, it's tougher to know where the audience is from. So I'll cover some basics here that uh, if you're in Canada right now, you probably know this stuff, just so bear with me. Um, Canada has 10 provinces and three territories. Uh, the three territories are all in the north. The 10 provinces are strung along in the south part of the country. Um, you might see references in your research to different areas of Canada, including central Canada, which is basically southern Ontario and southern Quebec, the Maritimes, Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, and Prince Edward, Prince Edward Island, Atlantic Canada, which is the Maritimes plus Newfoundland and Labrador, uh, which is Newfoundland and Labrador is, is the name of a, of a, of a province um, in its entirety. Western Canada is the four Western provinces. The Prairie provinces are Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Manitoba. And this kind of thing comes up because there was migration from say Ontario in central Canada uh, to the prairies. And that would be the three provinces um, I just mentioned. And then the north is the three territories. Um, I don't meet a lot of people with roots in that area because the population is quite small. But that said, some people have, have interest in that area because uh, the family moved there for a while, especially during the gold rush years in the late 1800s. 
You might also find references to Upper Canada or Canada West, which is today's Ontario, Lower Canada or Canada East, which is today's Quebec, and the Northwest Territories, bear in mind, until 1905, the Northwest Territories included Alberta and Saskatchewan. So just bear in mind some of the changes that have happened with, with uh, boundaries and so on over the years. The country, um, you know, as you know, sits, sits on top of the U United States. The provinces are much, much larger than, than most American states, with the exception of sort of Texas and Alaska. Uh, but the population is pretty much sort of strung along the, uh, the border with the US. Um, the probably 90% of the population lives within 100 miles of that border, uh, just you know, in terms of climate and so on. It's, it's better living down there, basically, in that, that part. Um, why bother with Canada? Uh, first of all, your own ancestry might take you there. Um, the border was fluid. People moved move both ways, back and forth and back and forth. I've seen that many times in my family. Uh, branches of the families made different choices. I've got a lot of relatives in Canada. I've got a lot of relatives in the States as well. And when they came over from, from, from Europe, some, some went to Canada, some went to the States. Um, I've I'm, I've, I'm born in British Columbia, lived most of my life in British Columbia. I have more relatives in Washington State than I do in British Columbia, uh, just because of the way things have worked out over the years. Records in the other country might also provide important clues. That's because different information was required at different times by the, by the two countries. And um, uh, some, some records are available in one country that are not available in another country. An example of the kind of information you might find in Canada is that Canadian census is required uh, information on the person's religion, um, which, which you don't find in, the, in, the, in the American census records. And there are several notable people that are worth, worth, worth uh, mentioning. Raymond Burr, who was Perry Mason and Ironside and so on, was born in New Westminster, British Columbia in Canada. Uh, his uh, father was, uh, was Canadian, his mother was, was uh, was American, I believe, born in Chicago, which is one, one small example of, of who you might find. Gladys Smith, this is one of the more famous Canadians to make it, make it big in Hollywood. Gladys Smith, uh, born in, in Toronto. And uh, Gladys was went by another name. She was America's sweetheart. Um, and what people don't necessarily realize is that America's sweetheart was really Canada's sweetheart first. Uh, as Mary Pickford, she became known, known as America's sweetheart. Things to remember when you're doing research in Canada. Civil registration is by province, um, not nationally, it's by province. The most recent national census is from 1921. You will find a census for uh, the prairie provinces, the three, the three prairie provinces for 1926. The reason they did those extra census, uh, censuses in between the national ones was because the population of the prairies was growing so rapidly, they had to keep up with, uh, with the count of the people because the, because the census is what triggered things like representation in parliament plus spending on, on services and that kind of thing. Um, and that's, that's for 1926, it is available on family search. Um, the 1931 national census will be released in two years. Immigration records up to 1935 are available. Um, and bear in mind, there was very, very spotty immigration into Canada after the start of the Great Depression in 19, 1929, 1930. There is no national death index. Uh, the closest we have to that would be find a grave. There's nothing like the Social Security Death Index for Canada, and that can be a, be a, a problem. Um, when I'm looking into my American um, or looking for American relatives and so on, DNA matches that kind of thing. I use a variety of sites such as been verified. There is nothing like that for Canada. You can't find that kind of information as readily as you can elsewhere. So there are some limitations when you're dealing with Canadian research. Uh, but another thing that's important to note is the way that the, that the country developed. Um, a lot of Canada, and, and Canadians hate hearing this, but a lot of Canada is the product of the American Revolution because loyalists moved north um, in, into British territory when the revolution took place or in the years after the revolution. So as a result, uh, there was a huge rush of people coming up from, this, from the new US 
into Canada, into Ontario, Quebec, Nova Scotia, New Brunswick. That resulted in basically the creation of, of, of the, or the, the roots of the Canadian nation at that point. And you can see that uh, in, the, in the early, early days of Canada after Confederation, that is basically what Canada was, the red and the green, or sorry, the, the red and the blue on, the, on this, this, this uh, map. Um, that was the original Canada when it was, when it was created in, in 1867. And then when it comes to immigration, um, the major, major ports for Canadian um, immig immigration into Canada were Quebec and in, in Quebec, St. John in New Brunswick and Halifax in Nova Scotia. But all of those paled considerably to the ports in Portland, Boston, New York, Philadelphia, Baltimore, that kind of thing. They were much more significant. And if you look at the map, you'll see that the, the distance to get from New York to Toronto um, is not that, that, that far compared to Halifax to, to Toronto. So a lot of people would have come into an American port on their way to Canada. The same thing applies in reverse because I have relatives who came through Quebec to go to Washington state. Um, I've got relatives who came to, from New, through New York to come to British Columbia. Like there, there's no guarantee one way or the other, but be, be, always bear in mind that when you're dealing with Canadian ancestors, you might find an American connection there as you're doing your work. On the West Coast, uh, the major ports were, were Victoria and Vancouver, but there was not that much immigration uh, through the, uh, um, from Europe through the, through the, through the, through the Western um, ports. Um, I have found some people who went all the way around uh, into Australia, then up to here or into Manila and up to here, that kind of thing. Uh, for the most part, what we, what we saw through Victoria and Vancouver were uh, Japanese and Chinese people coming in to, uh, to live here. The, the, the last spike uh, in 1885 uh, was, was the completion of the Transcontinental Railway um, in British Columbia, uh, a significant time for, for the development of the country because now it was possible to get from one, one side to the other without going through um, the sheer misery of, of river rafting and, and wagons and so on, or, or going down and, and, and crossing the, the, crossing the uh, uh, on the on the American railways, which had been been built a few years earlier, some people even went um, to get from from Eastern Canada to Western Canada before the railway came in. They took a boat down to Panama, then crossed the Isthmus of Panama, and then came up the coast. Um, things had to be done, you know, in whatever way they could. Uh, I also find it quite interesting when when you're looking at the creation of a country to see how people would have gotten from one spot to another. Before the railway came into being, uh, people who were, who were going from southern Ontario to southern Manitoba, which was a standard route back in the 1870s, because homestead land was made available in Manitoba at that time, uh, they would go by boat um, quite often to Duluth, Minnesota, down to Minneapolis, then on up by, by rail or, or by cart, whatever, to Winnipeg. They would also take, take, the, uh, take a train from Sarnia, Ontario, down to Chicago, up to Minneapolis, and the rest of the way. And I think that explains why one of my relatives uh, ended up in Duluth, simply because I think the family probably got, got as far as that and said, we've gone far enough, we'll, we're going to stay here. There were plenty of jobs to be had, and employers in places like Duluth knew that these people were going through um, to start a homestead, to, to, to have a really, really tough life ahead of them. And the, 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 the employers could sort of grab people coming in off the boat and say, why don't you stay here? I've got a job for you right here. You don't have to build a sod hut. You don't have to do any of that hard work. You can actually have a comfort, comfortable life here right away. So that, that I think explains why I end up with relatives in Duluth for many, many years. Um, and also if, as late as 1906, this is a, it's from the Sioux line, uh, they, were, they, were, they were basically promoting homesteads um, in North Dakota, South Dakota, Manitoba, and Western Canada, et cetera, uh, all at the same time, because the, the rail lines would work together to get settlers out there. Getting down to what you find online, uh, the most important Canada-wide sites are FamilySearch, Ancestry, 
Library and, Ar and Archives Canada. Those are the big ones to always look at. Uh, Canadiana is another site that I'm going to touch on simply because it's not that well known. It's not that easy to use necessarily, but it does have some really good material, not necessarily for genealogy, but for family history, like actually learning more about your people. It's, uh, it's an important one to, to use. And Can Genealogy is a site that I put together um, over the past 20 years, basically the idea being to provide links to all of the important sites in, uh, uh, for, for Canadian research. It's similar to Cindy's list, except it is more of a Canada-wide, um, oh, so exclusive to Canada a site. And I've also sorted it. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a journalist by training. So what, how I've sorted these, these, these pages with our, is by, by importance, basically. So, so the, more that, uh, the more value you'll, you'll find in a resource, the higher up it's going to be on my pages. The idea being that you can, you can dive into one of these pages and at the top of the screen, you'll find something that's, that's relevant to your research. Um, it's a free site, so please don't hesitate to use it. Can genealogy, I've got, I've got um, sources sorted by province and then within each province, general, general sites, then newspapers, then directories. You'll also find uh, pages uh, by topics such as census, military, that kind of thing. A major, major site that I'm sure we all use is Family Search. Um, a lot of Canadian information here. Uh, it's, um, it, it, it doesn't have everything, but it has so much, and it's also obviously free. Um, and there are many, many benefits to using Family Search. The, uh, the, uh, the family tree, uh, trees that are here are also excellent in terms of getting, um, you know, sharing information with other people. So can, can, the Canada pages on Family Search would be a spot for, for, a spot for people to start at. And you can see a variety of, of um, um, different sources when you click on Canada. And don't hesitate to go into the ones that are image only. That's what we used to do back in the day. We, we would go through a roll of microfilm and find the people we, we, we wanted um, page by page by page. And I still get some, some joy out of doing that kind of thing because it's, uh, it, it, it's just fun to, to, to find something. It's rather, rather, rather than going into an index and finding something, it's more fun in some ways through the hard work. The other thing, of course, is that you might find that some, some indexing has not been done accurately. If people have done the, done the best they could, but in the end, you, uh, you might find that a name could be read two or three or four different ways and which one was it. I, I indexed many, many years ago, the census for the Lethbridge area in Southern Alberta. And I've had four people, I put it on my website. I've had four people since then contact me to say, you got these names wrong. And, and uh, they were right. I, just, I, I had a choice of how to, how to read the name and uh, um, I, I chose the wrong, the, the wrong direction. So when you're dealing with, with images only, that's you going in there and you looking at all of these names, you might be familiar with the names um, and maybe you'll find something that you won't find by relying on someone else's index. The BC archives, this is one example of why family search is good. Uh, BC Archives has an index to the deaths in British Columbia up to 20 years ago. And this is my grandfather who died in 1965. Um, fairly basic information here in the index, um, the, the, the date of his death, the place of his death, his age, and his name, and then a link to the actual registration, which is handy. If I go to family search, I find the same information plus his birth date, um, plus his birthplace, plus his spouse's name. So there's more information being shown. They, they, they drew, the, the, the indexers at Family Search drew more information off that original document than the BC Archives did. So as a result, there's more information available to you. It's easier for you to pin down um, information about, about someone if, if with all of this, inf this information available. Um, you can't always get, get copies of the, of the death registrations, but the, there can be enough um, details in, in, in this kind of thing. But again, that's on family search. So, so use that one if you possibly can, and then go back to the other one to, to, to see if there's an actual registration. That's what the registration of death looks like in British Columbia. They're available for, for some provinces. Um, 
BC, BC has the best collection online. You can get them easily from other provinces, other, but some provinces are more, more of a problem. Uh, go, to, go to Ancestry, you'll see the Canadian um, card catalog. Uh, the same kind of thing for, for any other country. Uh, there's a lot of material on Ancestry. The indexing is not always as good as it is on Family Search. Library and Archives Canada also has a lot of material online. Um, the, the website can be frustrating because it seems to have a lot of outages. So there, if it doesn't work for you one time, try again. I tried to get some fresh images last night and uh, for this talk, and the site was down. So I, you get used to that after a while. You know, it's uh, don't leave it till the last minute, basically. Uh, but there's a lot of material there and a lot of information that they have that uh, uh, documents that they have that you'll also find on Ancestry. The trick is that Library and Archives Canada relied on um, Ancestry's indexing of these of these these various sources. But then so when Ancestry did the indexing, they sent a copy to Library and Archives Canada. And the people at Library and Archives Canada then went through and corrected a lot of the, 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 the names, especially important with French names. Um, they, they, there were a lot of errors in those. So you'll find a more accurate index more often than not at Library and Archives Canada. And something, um, you know, an example of what you'll find basically with, with the Canadian um, Library and Archives Canada site, attestation papers. This is for the First World War. Here's someone from, from Tacoma in Washington who signed up with the Canadian military uh, because there were a lot of people who were eager to go over to fight uh, during the First World War before the US entered the war. Here's one example. Other sites that have Canadian information as well, Find My Past and My Heritage. Uh, these are two pages from, from those uh, sites. There's not a lot on those two sites for Canada. It's mainly, mainly the census and uh, you won't find much there that you won't find on Family Search or on or an Ancestry or Library and Archives Canada. Um, I'm hoping that things get better at some point, but so far I'm not seeing a lot that I can't find somewhere else. Canadiana is a is an important site. Canadiana has information that is not found on the other sites. The problem with it is it can be very very tough to use. So bear that in mind when when you uh, when you when you have trouble with it. Try not to get too frustrated. Um, because there is good stuff there. Canadiana.ca um, has, you know, you'll see an ever-evolving um, homepage when you, when you go to it for the first time because they have rotating images that roll, that roll through all, you know, so, so it's, it's ever-changing. Every time you, you refresh your screen, you'll see a new image there, which is cool. Not helpful to us for genealogy, but it's cool. Um, when, you, when you start diving into that kind of thing, you'll find good information. An example of the kind of stuff I'm talking about, um, one of my ancestral names is McKennett, and you can spell McKennett a variety of different ways. Uh, basically, one T or two, and an E or an I where the first asterisk is, and, and an E or an I where the second asterisk is. So you have to be a bit creative when you're doing, doing any kind of work with, with that name. Fortunately, using the wild cards available on Canadiana, I could do some research. Um, into the McKennets, and I, I searched for Manitoba as well to narrow it down to the McKennets living in Manitoba. And you can see some of the some of the uh, things here, like what what settlers say of the Canadian Northwest. Um, a fairly a fairly interesting uh, source. This is this is the the bottom name here, Jay McKennett from Pendennis, Manitoba. This was part of a report. He had to fill out information. For the government or for the or, or for the Canadian Pacific Railway, which both gathered information from from settlers on what it was like. The idea being to, to convince more people to come out there, and he reported that he had his land had had gravelly clay. He got water from a well. It was not difficult to find wood. That kind of thing. Um, it's, this is the kind of thing that doesn't take you back a generation when you're doing research, but it gives you a better sense of what it was like for people. Uh, who are living there, who are, who are trying to create a, a farm for themselves. Another interesting thing that I came across using that search in Canadiana, it was a kid's column in a farm newspaper. And fascinating information here. My father has taken the farmer's advocate for a year and a half. I like to read the letters in the corner. 
I thought I'd write my own letter, blah, blah, blah. My father has two horses, two cows, a number of hens and one pig. I have one brother and two sisters. I am the eldest in the family. We live on the banks of the Cheval River and summer can play in the water. There's information there that you would find in the census. There's also information that you would not find in the census. That it is actually adding more information um, and also giving, giving a sense of who the kid was. A seven-year-old, he was, he was out there, he was creative. He was writing a letter off to the editor. Um, that's the kind of thing you can come across in when you go outside the regular sort of realm of, of genealogical sources. Uh, part of Canadiana is something called the Eritage Collection. It has about 41 million pages um, taken from 25,000 microfilm reels. And these are all microfilms held by Library and Archives Canada. They do not appear on the Library and Archives Canada website. So you can actually get into these microfilms digitally in your own home uh, to, to see what they have. And there is some interesting, interesting stuff there. My great great grandfather was David Ellerby, lived in southern Ontario. And so there are references to him in the land books and so on. And it was using one of those uh, links that I found at the top of the second page there, a reference to him getting a grant of land in 1823, which is the first time I was able to sort of pin down when he arrived in Canada. It was sometime before, before he got the land grant in 1823. So, so a, a nice find available to me through that, through that site. So, so try that, you know, play a bit with, with, with Canadiana, it's worth doing. There are also several sites from across Canada. I'll just give you a, a quick overview, a sample basically sort of as, as you will. Always, always look for provincial archives websites. Um, you'll find good material at, in, in all of them basically. So, so don't hesitate to look there. And again, I have, can, uh, I have the Can Genealogy website and I have information um, or the links are more or less in order of importance. The idea being that you'll be able to go onto these sites. You might not have any idea where to, where to, where, where to find a reference to your, to your people in Canada. You start at the top and you work down and, and odds are you're gonna come across something that'll give you some clues and help you. So it's all basically in, in order of, of preference. That's, that's my opinion, basically what, what matters most. It won't apply to everybody, but still it's a starting point. Uh, in, in, uh, in Alberta, they have uh, placed marriage indexes, birth indexes, death indexes online. Uh, they're, they're a bit on the primitive side because they're not, they're not indexed the way we'd expect them. But this is a massive, massive step forward for Alberta because we've had problems there for many, many years in terms of what was available to us. That, that kind of site leads to um, death registrations. This is my grandfather's uncle. I uh, could find him using the Alberta uh, death index and the cost of these things. Um, it's, it's, uh, you have to, you have to basically um, uh, order them, but, but I, I you know, and, and they cost what $5 a piece, whatever it is, but it's, it's, it's effectively overnight, <clears throat> overnight service. So it's worth, worth going after some of the people you're interested in. <clears throat> while, while you're on the prairies, there's a site called Peel's Prairie Provinces, which is an amazing tool uh, showing a lot of, a uh, lot of, again, different things. They're not genealogical sources, but they're interesting um, ways to add information to your family history. An example of that, I just searched my own last name and I found 51 hits in Peel, including a, a copy of, an, of, of a newspaper that was published by the University of Alberta back in the 1920s. Um, and my grandfather's service station had an ad in that newspaper. I had never seen a copy of an ad uh, from, him, from him before, but there we are. Um, I had looked in, in other newspapers for an ad for his, for his business, but I never, I never found one referring to it. Logically, if I'd thought about it, he was right next door to the, to the university, so why didn't I look there first? But anyway, I did find it through Peel. Saskatchewan has uh, vital stats online, an index online. Manitoba, the same thing. Manitoba is, is more complete and updated more often than, than, than Saskatchewan. Problem with Manitoba right now is that they are months and months and months behind in fulfilling orders. So you might find somebody there 
um, and that'll be where it sits for another year or so after you order the, the document. Manitoba also has probate files on family search. This was an incredible thing to, to get because there's no really good death index uh, you know, for recent years for Manitoba. If, if they had a probate file, um, they, that would be mentioned, their name would be mentioned, the, the date of death and so on. So it's very, very good. And I found people there who, who were not living in Manitoba, but who had assets there. One of my relatives uh, died in Redlands, California in San Bernardino County, and she had property in, in Manitoba, so, so she shows up in, in the probate index. Ontario, a really cool resource that more people should use is the Ontario Cemetery Finding Aid. This is basically bringing together information from um, all the different extracted cemeteries they could get their hands on. Back in the old days, people would publish, or societies would publish those books of death records, uh, cemetery records, this brings them all together into, into one spot with a link then reference, reference, referencing you to, to where you can find more information. A very, very handy way to get, uh, to get um, ideas of where the family was from in Ontario. And uh, this site's been around for about 25 years now, and it's always updated. Uh, they've about 3.5 million interments now. Ontario County maps are also helpful. This is on a McGill University website. Um, and you can click on each of these, uh, each of the counties, and then see the landowners in different parts of the county. It's all rural, it's not urban, but it, it does show where, where, where old farms were, which is handy to have. Lots of information from Quebec available online. There's a couple of pay sites that have information, plus, uh, plus free sites, plus Ancestry has some uh, good information, uh, good sources from Quebec as well. And when you're on the topic of Quebec, uh, don't be afraid by, of, of the language. If there is, if, if you do find records in French, um, it's not that tough to get through them for the most part. The basic information included in an obituary is the same in French or in English. You just have to go through and, 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 and decide what, what it's actually, what, what information it's telling you because uh, the information is, is very similar. Going through this one, this is for, 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 for my, my my uncle's um, wife's family. Um, a lot of information here that uh, um, is, is really, really straightforward. You can go through this and determine how many kids there were, the names of the kids. You can figure out who, who the pallbearers were and so on. Just looking for the typical information you'd find in an obituary. So don't be afraid of that. New Brunswick, vital stats again, a, a great index site. Nova Scotia, the same thing. Prince Edward Island has a site that's done by basically some really, really keen people. Um, they've, they've gathered as much information as they could about Prince Edward Island from a wide variety of genealogical sources and put it all onto one site. The idea being that people can get a sense of, um, of what there is. I've, I, the population of Prince, Prince Edward Island has never been that huge. Uh, it's a small island, but the, I have used this site to find more information on, uh, on family members, even I even tracked down uh, a birth family um, for a friend of mine using information on this site. I was able to figure out what, what kind of resources I should be looking at and what there was available to me. So it's, it's worth doing. A couple of, a couple of good sites for, for Newfoundland as well, Newfoundland and Labrador uh, the, is the proper name of the, of the province. And again, all of these links you'll find on CAN genealogy. So rather than going through all of them in, individually, just I'm pointing you towards those, those sites. And again, you'll find a lot of interesting connections um, with Canadian uh, researchers and, or Canadian, Canadian family members and, and, and links to, to famous people and so on. Nora Hendricks, who died in Vancouver at, at 100 years of age, was Jimi Hendrix's grandmother. Uh, you know, he had, he had good, strong links back to Vancouver from his home in Seattle. And another person who was of, of note, um, the, the, again, a, another Vancouver slash Seattle connection was Sadie Marks, who, who became very, very famous in, um, in Hollywood uh, as Mary Livingston, appearing on the, on, the, on, the, on the radio shows and so on with, with Jack Benny. Jack Benny and Mary Livingston came back to Canada many, many times to do benefits and charity work for the Children's Hospital in Vancouver. 
um, but she never forgot her roots in, uh, in this area. The links are, first of all, the handout, uh, it's on daveobi.com. Um, so you'll find four pages there that might help you in terms of in terms of Canadian research and links you'll find on can genealogy so don't hesitate to use that site um, the site itself is free um, it does link in some cases to pay sites but um, there aren't there aren't that many basically that are that are pay sites most are free and even if it is a pay site the, the, the idea here is that it will get you some get you started towards the direction you have to go when you're dealing with uh, with uh, Canadian research. And with that, I tried to rush through this. We could have more more time for questions. So um, I'm game. If there are any questions coming, off we go. Um, there is one question from Peter asking, "How can I find my Swedish ancestor?" Oh, how can I find whether my Swedish ancestor got naturalized in Canada? Uh, what's the time frame? 544. No, 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 no. So, sorry. What, the, the, uh, what, what year would the person have been naturalized? Oh, I see. Yeah, Peter, if you could uh, send that information in the chat or Q&A, &A, that'd be helpful. Thank you. Yeah, basically, until, until records before 1917 are pretty, 1899. Okay, you might have trouble then. Um, records before 1917 are, are, are fairly flaky. After 1917, it was, it was uh, um, the rules were made stricter and there's, there are better indexes available. Uh, 1899, you might find a reference in, on, on the census or whatever, that kind of thing. Um, how old was the person? Um, uh, like, would they appear in, in, in a voter's list later on? You had to be a Canadian to be in the voters list, but that started in 1935. That's when, the, when those are available. Uh, but you might find, for 1899, you might find a reference in a local courthouse uh, to, to something being done. It depends where they were in Canada. He was born in 1886, so he'd be probably under his parents then in terms of being naturalized. Um, you might find him. Uh, how? Sorry to ask one more question here. Did he did he remain in Canada? Like if, if he remained in Canada, you know, uh, to, to the point where he would appear in the nineteen thirty five voters list, that would be a sign that he had been that he'd been naturalized. There was no Canadian citizenship as 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 it is generally understood until nineteen forty seven. When you were naturalized, you simply became a subject of the British Crown until 1947. He went to New Zealand, not sure when, okay. Um, all you can be, be looking for would be, would be some sort of court record, I would imagine, and you're at your, uh, where, 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 whatever town they were in, and it would be under his parents, I assume, unless he came over as a, as a child with someone else. So I'm not giving a lot of help here or hope. Any other questions? Nick Post asked, where can, would I find best sites for native Canadians, example, Algonquin in Ontario? Uh, Library and Archives Canada is the best site for, uh, for indigenous uh, research. Um, a lot of information has been put together over the years um, and there's a massive, massive effort underway to sort of get as much information as can be, can be acquired uh, for, for uh, for like First Nations research. Start with Library and Archives Canada and take it from there. Um, I've got a, a, friend in, a friend in Saskatchewan who's done a lot of work on, on, um, on Indigenous ancestry as well, but that probably won't help you for, uh, for Ontario. But, but Library and Archives Canada first. I'm not hearing nope. a lot of. I'm, I'm not, not seeing any other questions. Okay. Um, so I think we can just go ahead and wrap it up then. Okay. Um, so I'm going to share my screen. Oh wait, someone said oh, something. In the chat. Oh, yeah, there is one more. How would I find it, whether he came from from Sweden by himself? Look for passenger lists. Passenger lists for for that period were were uh, are available, and they should be. Uh, 
you know, they're, they're indexed whether he would have come through Canada or, or like New York uh, or whatever, we don't know, but uh, look for the passenger list. And the community he went to is probably, probably relevant as well because um, would he have gone to, a, to an area that is, um, has a lot of uh, Swedish people in it? Um, that was very, very common in terms of uh, you know, mass migration. Uh, there were areas on the prairies. In that time period, I'm assuming he went to the prairies. Uh, and that there, are, there, are, there, there, there has been work done on the various um, ethnic communities that, that were sort of set up on the prairies um, by the new arrivals. So check there, check the 1901 census for him. Uh, that would give his, uh, his year of arrival in Canada. Um, sometimes that information is accurate, sometimes it's not. Um, but check for the year of arrival in Canada and also check for the passenger lists because they're available for, um, from 1865 on. Uh, they're not perfect, no, no source is perfect, but they should be, that should be a help in terms of getting information on him. Awesome, thank you. And um, thank you, Dave, for that wonderful webinar. I learned so much more about doing Canadian research. And Great. thank you, everybody, for joining us today. Um, we hope you will join us for our next webinar, which will be on November 3rd, researching the Great Northward Migration 1916 to 1970, the movement of 6 million African Americans with James Tanner. And a recording of this webinar will be made available next week. And you can view that on our YouTube channel or our website. If you have any comments or questions, you can always email us at fhl underscore webinars at byu.edu or follow Facebook and Twitter. Thank you and have a wonderful week.